Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping before I introduce Mr. Schumat. Uh, if you have cell phones, please turn them off. Everything is being recorded this evening, so even if you whisper, it will be heard in cyberspace. <laughs> I want to thank all of our sponsors this evening, uh, our Calvert Library and our wonderful Robin, the Bayside History Museum, and the John Hanson chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution, who have provided all the goodies for you in the back, by the way, for when this lecture is finished. Donald Brady Schumann. Really doesn't need much of an introduction, but he's going to get one. Uh, he began his early professional career after graduating from Pratt Institute at the Wall Street Journal, Boiler Publishing, and the Washington Post. For more than two decades afterwards, he served on the staff of the Library of Congress as the head of graphics, while simultaneously serving as the director of the Nautical Archaeological Associates. As a historian, he has served as a cultural resources management consultant for numerous states and federal agencies, museums, universities, nonprofit establishments, and both the United States and Great Britain as well. As a maritime archaeologist, he has worked in the United States, Canada, and Western Europe under the sponsorship of such institutions as the National Geographic Society, the National Park Service, the United States Navy, and various educational foundations and museums. Don is the author of 20 books, the most recent being a book of poetry and photography, Navigational Hazards, and his award-winning history, Anaconda's Trail, Civil War and the Potomac Frontier. His many scientific and popular activities have appeared in such publications as National Geographic, History and Technology, Sea History, and many others. His current publication effort is a history entitled Siege, the Canadian Campaign and the American Revolution. Three-time winner of the prestigious John Lyman Book Award for the Best American Maritime History. Two-time winner of the Marion Brewington Award for the Best United States Naval Directory. The highest award in Maryland for historic preservation. He is also the recipient of an honorary Doctorate of Humane Letters degree from the University of Baltimore for all of his contributions to history, science, and the arts. Among his most recent projects was the instigation and development of the first national marine sanctuary system in the Chesapeake Tide River at Mallows Bay on the Potomac River. Without further ado, Mr. Schumacher. Well, I'm standing in for him tonight. <laughs> um, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, tonight, uh, those of you I see familiar faces out there, is that working? Yeah. Gosh, it works. Um, my normal talks, are, of course, are on maritime history or archaeology or underwater something or another. Um, but tonight, I'm going to veer off from something and into a talk which is rather personal because it has to do uh, with uh, some family members. Uh, but it is a bit of history. The story that I'm going to tell is a true story. It's a sad story. It's a story of tragedy. It's a story of murder. It's a story of love that transcends that barrier between life and death. The story is called Briar Patch, the murder that would not die, and you will see why in just a few minutes. If this will change, will that change? Why isn't it moving?
Thank you, Robin. <laughs> I'm a dinosaur, by the way, technologically. Um, in order to take into this story, I have to go back 67 years. I was 13 years old at that time. To a specific date, June 15, 1955, which was a very interesting period in time. And I guess we would look at it as innocence by today's standards. The world was different. We had just come out of 10 years before World War II. We're the mightiest nation on the, on the face of the earth. We are a nation that is growing. We are a nation that is a dynamic nation. We are educating our people as never before. Men are coming back from World War II and going to college on the GI Bill. We're building highways across the country under the Eisenhower administration, connecting America like it had never been connected before. We have an enemy, Russia. <clears throat> Surprise. We have this enemy that has got the bomb, and we are worried about being bombed. We are worried about World War III, which is very close. The time clock is that they just instituted is about three minutes to zero, uh, 12. And the, uh, the upshot is that the government is tech making tests in Washington. On June 15th, they're going to evacuate Congress in a test in case the city is bombed. The only person who left the city was the president. But what happens in the local areas? What happens in Montgomery County, in Prince George's County, in Calvin County? How has this affected that? Well, it's a huge piece of our growth. Before World War II, Prince George's County was largely agrarian. Montgomery County was almost entirely agrarian. Certainly Calvin County was. And after the war, all of that changes. Prince George's County is growing by Topsy. Montgomery County is growing. Where farms were, condos are going up, not condos, but up private homes. People who never could afford a home during the Depression before World War II are now buying homes. This is a big deal. And this is the, the world of 1955. There's some wonderful things. You could go to Washington Airport, which is not much bigger than a cow pasture there, and get a plane trip ticket to New York for 12 bucks. You could sit in a seat and not have your knees underneath of your chin. <laughs> you could get a steak dinner and sit at a table. It was an incredible thing. This is new. They had electric typewriters. You don't need that old stuff. You got this electric machinery. New stuff's coming. Buy a shirt for $1.98. You buy a suit for 50 bucks. Nice suit. Just in a common home. Records. The new 45. This is the beginning of the period of rock and roll. This is this is where we are living. This is what's happening. Prince George's County, this is happening incredibly fast. Homes are going up all over the place. There's about 45 movie theaters in the area. And this is interesting because movie theaters are all privately owned. They're all owned by one person instead of corporations. I think we have 100 and some now, which are owned by three corporations. Uh, the, uh, the challenge, however, is television. Television is just coming in. And what do we have on television on June 15? We got some really cool things. You know, this is your life. Uh, we've got Howdy Doody. We've got a ball game. Ball game on television. You can watch the Washington ball team take on the Cleveland Indians on television. Don't have to go to the ball game. And one of the things that we got on television on that Wednesday night, at 8 o'clock, was Disney. He had just come on television, and he had just put on a movie, Davy Crockett. <laughs> Every kid in America has a coonskin cat. <laughs> this is the world of June 15, 1955. Now, 
On June 14th, my, my mother and father and my brother and myself had gone over to visit um, his brother, my uncle Prince, and his wife Lucy, and their kids. There were three kids. Nancy is the oldest, born in 1938, and this picture does not do her justice. She was a beautiful, beautiful girl. She's 16 years old. Her little brother, Petey, he's a whoops, Nord. I mean, he is a, he's a kid that's always in trouble. And everybody loves him. And the youngest is this little girl who is uh, an adopted child. Uh, she is the youngest. She is uh, six years old. Her name is Kathy Ann. And that was the Shonet family in a new development over by the University of Maryland. Now, Nancy is um, I guess you would call her by today's standards the queen bee of her social group. She was beautiful, she had a lot of boys chasing her, and she was a member of the team club. There was all kinds of things. She's a, a sophomore, a, a junior, um, at this brand new school, Northwestern High School. It's only two years old, and um, she is uh, going over there, and on this day, She's going to go over and pick up her report card for the end of the year. This is her class photographs. She's, the, she's up there in the far left with a little white thing around her. Uh, but she is a beautiful child. Uh, she has, she has um, idols. She has Eddie Fisher. Is, uh, he's going to be on television that night. And that's, boy, she's got some items and these are a couple of them. Uh, and her best friend is a 14 year old girl that lives two, two houses down, Mikey, or Michael and Ryan, or Mikey who is the girl in the far right. And Mikey is also um, a beautiful girl. This, these pictures do not do them justice, these are press photos. Uh, and Mikey, um, she is um, the cat's meow. She likes to wear tight shorts. She is, uh, her father is a police private for the Metropolitan Police Department. And uh, she attends uh, St. Joseph's Parochial School in Washington, D.C., which is, um, uh, it's rather uh, upper class. Uh, her father is really pressing to be able to keep her there. And two days before this, she had just been confirmed at her confirmation and she was quite beautiful there. When she was fixed up, she was the cat's meow. She looked like she was 18, 19 years old. And she had boys chasing her too. These two girls were the cat's meow. Now they all, in that neighborhood, were members of the Lewisdale Teen Club, which is down at Lewisdale Elementary. And the club was several blocks down from where they lived, which is here, A is, is uh, the uh, Shona household, and B is the Ryan household. Now, on the 15th, that morning, Mikey and Nancy are going to go over to Northwestern High School together. Nancy's going to pick up her, her uh, report card, and they're going to make the shortcut, which they always did through Northwestern Branch Park, which is literally right across the street from where they live. Cross the little bridge, cut through some people's backyards, and then go down to the school, which is just down the way. And this was the route that they were supposed to take. And at 8 o'clock that morning, Nancy puts on her very best orchid dress. They're going to have a picnic after this. The picnic is going to be convened in the park, and a bunch of her boy, uh, boyfriends and girlfriends they're all going to have a picnic over there, and it's going to be the end of the school year. That doesn't happen. This uh, child here is walking through the park about 8.20, 8.30, and her dog pulls her over to a spot. And what does the dog find? The dog finds a body. The body wearing an orchid dress. She goes home, tells her mother, 
the mother calls the police and comes and inspects and then calls the police. And very soon, the place is swarming with police officers. Um, my uncle Print had gone looking for her because she hadn't shown up. Some of the kids had come back and said, where's Nancy? We're supposed to have a picnic. And the kids uh, kind of alerted him that she should be found somewhere. So he goes to the school and can't find her. But then he sees the police officers down in the park. He goes down there and he recognizes instantly the orchid colored dress pulled up over the body's uh, chest and head. There's blood everywhere. The police descend in mass. Prince George's County Police arrive on the scene, as does the one police officer for the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission, Reds Roby, who later on becomes a very big, big person in the park and planning. Uh, and they are moving around, and one of the officers then finds another body. And the other body is Mikey Warner. Now the coroner comes out before anything is moved. The coroner comes out and he looks at the bodies and he says, oh, they've been stabbed multiple times with an ice pick. Those wounds are ice pick wounds. Well, he was really off because he worked for Prince George's. Um, they were bullet holes. 15 shots in Nancy. Three in Mikey. This was a horrific murder. They're looking around for evidence, and here's a map. You can see where the, um, the Shonut and Ryan Holmes were, and their route to the uh, to the park, to the park, uh, to the little bridge that they went across, and then um, make the shortcuts to people's yards. Print and Lucy are bereft. Print is a construction man, a union man. Uh, the AFL-CIO is trying to unionize Washington, and he's been out of work. And they are bereft. They're a little hard-pressed for money at this time. And little Kathy was even more so, because she was going to go with them. And Nancy told her, you can't do this now. Uh, later on, you can go with them. Now, Kathy idolized literally idolized Nancy, the older sister. If she didn't have her mother, it wouldn't have mattered because Nancy was the person. And Nancy had imbued with her a, uh, a motto that stayed with her throughout her life. And that was, when you come up against the situation, just do it. That was the situation, just do it. <clears throat> Whatever it was, just do it. That lived with her for the rest of her life. That evening, the Washington Evening Star, which was the biggest paper in Washington at the time, um, ran a little block on the murder. But it was such a horrific murder that it made the front pages the next morning all over the United States. And my uncle, uh, Tommy, who was Prince's brother, was construction, I mean, uh, was a heavy uh, uh, truck driver who was hauling cigarettes to Chicago. And he hears it on the radio. And he becomes, he just turns right around and comes back. The whole family gathered. The funerals were two days down the way, and uh, this is the funeral of, of uh, Nancy. Um, Lucy and Print uh, buried over at, uh, uh, over at uh, Fort Lincoln Cemetery. And uh, it was, uh, I was there, it was a hard thing. There was hundreds of people. And among those hundreds of people were a lot of cops. Do we have any cops in the audience? No? Okay. Because you probably remember this, this is a big deal. Uh, they buried her in Fort Lincoln Cemetery, and then the burial for um, for uh, Mikey. And she has a service at St. John Baptist de La Salle Church, uh, where she had been confirmed 
and then and let all the cemetery she is buried. Again, with a lot of police officers. The shamans go back home and try to pull things together. Uh, it was very difficult because phone calls started coming in. Mysterious phone calls. He, Pete, gets a little upside, upset. And he says, he goes and gets his BB gun. He said, I'm going to go out and kill that man, whoever did it. I'm going to kill him. This was a terrible, terrible crisis for him. He stayed with him all of his life. Now, at that time, Chris George's County had a police department, which wasn't that big. Didn't even have a homicide uh, branch. Because at that time, there was only two or three murders a year in Prince George's County, not like the 200 a year now. And the new police chief, George Pantagoulos, had never had a homicide case. He came in from Beltsville, where the police department was two guys. And he was one of them. Well, he was working for a county commission, which Prince George's County was under commission for the government at the time. And he launches into this. Um, I think it's going to be an easy case because, well, it's got to be a gun somewhere. Uh, and they um, start checking out this whole area, the whole police force, and the D.C. Police Department come in on this case because the daughter of a D.C. cop was killed. Pretty soon the FBI is starting to look at it too. Now, if you look at it from the Google um, map here, uh, you can see where the teen club was, where both girls were uh, the Saturday before the murders. Uh, where they lived and where the murder site was. If you go back here, you can see where the uh, high school is, Northwestern High School, and up to the far right is the University of Maryland. The bodies have obviously been moved, one of them anyhow, because there was big blood stains over by a briar patch. The, the murder victims were separated some, somewhat, and Nancy's body had obviously been moved and turned over. She had a bullet hole through her head. The bullet was found beneath the head, uh, but they couldn't find the shell casings. And then some phone calls started coming in, coming into the police department, uh, and coming into the Shonet residence, mysterious phone calls. He said, look under the cherry tree. And when they looked under the cherry tree, they found the shell casings. Not all of them, but they found some of them. Figured out it was a 22 caliber gun, not a nice pick. It was a 22 caliber uh, weapon, which they later identified as a Marlin. Um, and you can see by this picture where the X is, where the shooter probably was. Uh, again, the positions of the bodies and possible shooter. Now, George Panagoulis worked for the county, and his boss was a county commissioner um, um, who was not a particularly honest fellow. Uh, and one of the first people on the on the seen was Private Ryan. Thomas Ryan came down from the police department. And they call him, said, your daughter's been shot. And he gets onto the scene and he said, it's her boyfriend. It's that guy who's been chasing her. It says Norman Hager. Well, Norman Hager had graduated from high school and he was four years older than, or five years older than, than uh, uh, either of the girls, both of whom he had dated, both of whom he had been pursuing. And he tried to meet them in the park that morning. He was seen there, but he was with two other girls. Didn't matter. This is the guy. The police officer said, that's the guy. Arrest him. They didn't arrest him. They took him into custody. This is before Miranda. For 48 hours, they do a little rough stuff with him. Uh, they give him two uh, lie detector tests. They give him one meal. And finally, his parents get a lawyer and said, no, you got nothing on him. Well, he's telling a story that they're not listening to. And part of that story is, I saw a guy 
sitting on a bench with a rifle. Didn't pay any attention. Uh, this is a guy named Schweitzer who is put in charge, Captain Schweitzer, is put in charge of the case to find that murder weapon. Well, they set up a line across the park. They're looking for bullets, they're looking for stuff. They find a couple of things that are interesting, uh, but nothing definitive. They go down to the creek, and they are raking along the creek with uh, the police departments, raking on the creek, looking for that murder weapon. Can't find it. That murder weapon is, where the hell is it? They go to Fort Meade, George D. Meade, and they bring in a mine detecting unit to mine detect the entire creek in the vicinity for a mile and a half or two miles. And they are mine detecting up and down and nothing. They bring in the Boy Scouts. And they say, go over here and look at this lake. And the Boy Scouts are looking, they don't find anything. They bring in the county uh, and the, the local fire departments, the Children Fire Department, uh, the Delphi Fire Department. Find nothing. Maybe he buried it. Maybe the killer buried it. So they bring in Park and Planning Commission's heavy equipment, a bulldozer, and they bulldoze the ground. They move all of the all the foliage from the area. They don't find it. They go into the sewer systems. They get the army to go into the sewer systems to look for the gun. They find a toy pistol, a toy gun, but they don't find a weapon. They go and drain a nearby lake. No weapon. They bring in the army rangers and they go up and climb every single tree in the park, thinking that the gun might be up there somewhere. No weapon. They interview more than a thousand people that first week. And they ignore some of them because they were women. One of them who ultimately tells the actual time. Uh, but one of the guys they interview is this guy here, who's my uncle, my uncle uh, Rodney Ralph Shumack. He's a young man here. Uh, he had been a World War II hero. He went into Omaha Beach on day one. Uh, fifth man up on a bulldozer, push over a pillbox, and goes all the way through to Remagen, crosses the bridge at Remagen, and is put in charge of a concentration camp uh, as one of the soldiers there that had just been uh, freed. Comes back and becomes a construction man, like all of the Shemets. None of them had above an eighth grade education. All of them were um, depression children. Rodney was working on a job over by Delphi and saw the day before the murder a guy going into the woods. The man's going into the woods, he's carrying a rifle. And then the next morning, he sees him coming out. Of the, him and a number of the uh, laborers on the job. And they relate to the police a description of this fellow. And they said, well, we think he was carrying a bandolier. You know, like, like the Mexicans do down in the revolution. Um, looked like he was carrying some uh, web belts or a knife. And they made a composite drawing of him. And they call him the Pancho Villa killer. They send this picture out across the United States. This is one of the first times when an APB of this type goes out across the United States. The wife of the man who is the printer at Darby Printing goes down to the police line and says, I, got, I, I want to talk to somebody here. I said, go away, woman. We're busy. Well, it turned out that she knew what time the guns were fired. They placed it ultimately from other people at 8.15 a.m. They know the time of the murder. They know the time of the body being found. They know enough about the time scale. Well, this guy here, Jesse Baggett, is chairman of the Prince George's uh, Board of Commissioners. And he is as crooked as the day is long. He is selling favors. Um, they're building a thing called the Baltimore Washington Expressway. And he is um, um, kind of getting reciprocated with cash for looking the other way on zoning rulings. Ultimately, he'll go to jail uh, for two years, uh, but not now. 
And one of the reasons that he brought in Panagoulis was because of uh, Panagoulis' kind of backing him up. <coughs> Panagoulis' son actually later on is charged with murder, uh, and Panagoulis is charged with actually trying to help him escape. But that's a different story. Jesse Baggett tells Panagoulis, I don't care who you arrest. I don't care what you do. I want someone in jail. I want to get off of the front page because there's investigations going on here. He does not like publicity. And this is becoming a national scene. And his boss, um, Lance L. Claggett, the Democratic Party boss of the county, uh, he backs him up. And so this is, this is going to be a little rough. Now, one of the victims, I mean, one of the witnesses that they talked to said we saw two boys, two boys coming out, one carrying a gun going into Langley Park. Now, Langley Park is nothing like it is today. Langley Park was then being built. Langley Park is a, uh, uh, is, uh, a development which has happened. My uncle, one of my uncles was working over there uh, selling food to construction folks. Uh, he saw somebody going into the basement of a building being constructed carrying a gun. Another person said he saw him coming in, he weren't carrying a gun. Any positive there? Well, a couple different witnesses. But in the meantime, no gun has been found in the park, so what they are doing is send an order out to all of those county cops around and in Virginia, Northern Virginia. If you ever see a suspect person carrying 22, arrest them. 22 arrests. Anybody. Well, down here in Southern Maryland, everybody's carrying 22. All these kids are hunters. And a bunch of them are arrested. They can't hold them. There are people who actually say, uh, I did it. Because they are, they want to be on the newspaper. They want their picture in the newspaper. And some of them, a couple of, uh, 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 African Americans uh, said, I did it because they're looking for a place to get a three meal a day place. Put me in jail. They confiscate guns all over the place. They finally figure out what kind of gun it is. It is a Marlin Revelation pump action gun, which is a rapid fire gun. Bang, 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 bang. They tried to outlaw it, uh, but um, they couldn't do that same reason we don't today. And they are arresting everybody. They're arresting guys up in uh, Frederick County. They're arresting people down in Spotsylvania, Virginia. They're arresting people in St. Mary's. They're arresting them all over. They go to the school. And in the school, ha, there's a rifle club. But all the rifles are there and there's nothing questionable. Now this becomes pulp fiction. This gets out to the pulp magazines, the true detectives, modern detectives, and all of these magazines, Mystery of the Month. Uh, this is just one of them. It becomes the crime of the decade. Well, they can't figure out who did it. Now, in the meantime, the Shumlet residents are getting phone calls. Sounds like a teenager, nobody knows, but there's these phone calls coming in, and they're saying, could I speak to Nancy? Is Nancy there? Where's Nancy? And then I'll hang up. And they try to trace him, they can't. And finally, um, Bag uh, Baggett finally gets Panagoulis to tune this whole thing down, and he said, we're gonna put our best detective on it, and this is the guy Earl Huber, who is put on the case, and the case goes, nothing happens. Until the following year. June 1956. These two girls, Mary Elizabeth Feller, who is 16, and Shelley Jean Venable, who is 14, Decide they're going to go on an adventure. They're living up in Laurel, and they decide they're going to take them, they're going to go on an adventure, and they're going to hitchhike to Florida. They're not taking it, they're wearing their shorts, their flip flops, and they go out uh, on Route 1, 
they start thumbing. The car picks them up. And uh, Venable's sister, uh, brother, sees them getting into the car, green Ford. And they're not seen again. A little bit later in the month, they find Mary Elizabeth's uh, body up near Catoctin uh, in a baton, uh, near the Potomac. Uh, she had been raped and strangled, raped after death. Shelley Jean Venable was found about nine miles away several days later. She had been raped and shot in the head in the 38, but raped after death. The police don't know what to make of it. They go nowhere. The next year, in June 1957, Margaret Harold and her boyfriend, Sailor, are going to get married. He's going to ask her, he's got the ring, and he's going to ask her, and they're going to go off to, they're going to drive off to some little secluded place. They're up near Gambles, and they drive down this little road, there's an old beat up house nearby, unoccupied. And he's about ready to ask her when. This guy comes out of nowhere. And he says, you're on my property. What are you doing here? I know what you're going to do. I know why you're here. Thinking that they're going to start having a little illicit affair. Well, that's what they thought. And he's, he is raging at them. And then he opens the back door, gets in the car. Margaret turns around and shoots her in the face. The boy, or the man, sailor, jumps out and runs away. He manages to get away and get the police over. That too goes nowhere. The following year, August 1959, this is Mrs. Uh, Carol D. Jackson, lived down in Apple Grove, down in Virginia, uh, right off of Route 301. And they're driving all one night, and a car pulls up in front of them and blocks them. They can't go any further. And the driver gets out, and he's got a nickel plate at 38. And he comes up, and he says, get out of the car. And they get out of the car, and he puts the husband and the baby uh, in the trunk. And then a little bit later in the year, two boys up at Gambles, in the backwoods by the old house. They see hair sticking out from underneath of a fresh pile of dirt, and it is her, along with her little child. She has been garroted, strangled, had her head beaten in, and then raped after death. The child has also been raped with his head bashed in. They go into the house and they find the walls are covered with um, medical pornography, I guess you would call it, um, crime pornography, and just plain old pornography, which is a American um, And in this house, they get some clues, but they still end up nowhere. What to do? The psychiatrist in charge at St. Elizabeth's Hospital says, what we need is a psychic, somebody who can figure it out. And they bring in this guy, Peter Herkos, who is um, he's Dutch, and he's, he's written a bunch of books, and he's got his audience. And he gets on Del Malky's program. I don't know if any of you ever heard of Del Malky, but he was on WNAL. Had a talk show, one of the first talk shows. And, um, the word gets out, and the, the Del Malky's got this guy on. What that does is sets off a chain. He doesn't figure it out. Messages come into the FBI now about the murder. An unidentified person says, I know who did it, and he names him. 
J. Abram Hoover gets very interested in this. And this guy uh, is Melvin Davis Reese. Another one comes in, uh, and this time the FBI is able to trace who sent it, and it's this guy here, Glenn Mosier. Now, Glenn Mosier is a band member who works with Melvin David Reese. Melvin is a local guy. The band travels all over the country, but basically they got Blue Mirror. Some of you may remember, remember Blue Mirror. And um, he is uh, tied up with a stripper from the Gaiety Theater. Uh, that's her as a blonde, and that's her as a stripper at the Gaiety. And um, he is a very interesting character. Because they go to his house. He's no longer there. He's going somewhere. Jared Hoover opens up the, the whole kibosh to try and find him. And the reason that they're really looking for him is because he left a diary. And he describes in vivid detail about the murders of the Carroll family. And uh, all the joys that he got out of it and the perversions and so forth. But they trace him to a place um, in Arkansas where he is a music salesman and they bring him home. This is the uh, bullet and the drawing of him made by a witness and his uh, photograph. They capture him, they chase him, and he ends up in Selby, Tennessee, and they brought him in at Tennessee and they brought him back. Now, over time, he finally confesses. I killed, I killed the Carols. I killed the Venables. I killed those two girls. But I did not kill that Shomet girl and that other girl. By this time, the media has picked up on it, and he's called the sex beast. They were going to make a movie about it. They didn't. But after that, all of this kind of dies. Nancy is forgotten. Mikey is forgotten. Kathy starts to grow up. Now her motto is just do it. She puts this behind her and she starts growing up. This is with her, her friends and one of her uh, relatives. She graduates from high school. She is a beautiful, incredibly smart woman. Eventually she'll go to work with Sally Bride out in California. But in between then, she marries a Naval Academy graduate who becomes a captain, uh, assigned to the Philippines. She doesn't go. The marriage doesn't work. She has a child. The marriage doesn't work. And instead, um, she decides that she is going to go to college and get her law degree. She's going to go out to UCLA. Absolutely gorgeous woman. Just beautiful. She gets into the law school, and uh, she is working part-time as a model. She's a professional model, um, making a living out there. Until something happens. February 1990. We're what, 35 years from the murder. The Washington Post receives uh, an order for a, a, a memoriam in the obituary section. And the memoriam is to Nancy and Mikey. It's 35 years later. And nobody in the family put that memorial in. They are trying to figure out who did it. The case is reopened. Now, Print is on his last legs. He's not in good health. And Kathy comes home to take care of him and to see what she can do in this case because she remembers her sister saying, just do it. Can you help the police to do it? And from time to time, she thinks that Nancy is really with her in that room, wherever she is. She's an animal rights uh, person. She is a member of the Sierra Club. She begins to write the Sierra Club when she comes home. Uh, she is actually a copy editor for a while at my former publisher, Tidewater Publishers. And uh, she is a lovely person, incredibly smart. And she's taking care of her older father. They go and get a place over Corsica River, uh, the Redding, and she's taking care of her dad there. 
and her mother's dying. But while they're over there, something happens. She gets bitten by this little bug. It's a deer tick. And she gets Lyme's disease. Anybody in here had Lyme's disease? Lyme's disease, if it gets into the advanced stages, is horrible. Well, as soon as she had it, um, the doctors in 1990 did not think Lyme's disease was an issue. It's something else. You're having PTSD or you're having, uh, you're having uh, some other type of um, affliction, but this isn't an issue. They didn't have a test for it. And Borrelia burgdorferia, burgdorferi, um, gets into the system, it can change your DNA. It gets into the brain. And you can suffer a change of symptoms every two weeks. First it's your back, then it's your chest, then it's your, you can't breathe or any type of thing. Then it gets bad. Well, about this time, Pete Shomet receives a phone call. And it's from a guy I will call Harvey. I don't know if Harvey's here or not tonight, but I won't name you. But Harvey is um, he he tells Pete, he said, listen, I want to talk to you because I think I posted that that memorial in the post, and I think I know who the killer is. Pete, not, not an easy guy to get away from with sometimes. He talks to him a bit. Then he calls a friend of his who had been with him in high school, I think he was a basketball player, Steve Riker. And Steve Riker is a detective with the Prince George's County Police. And Steve Riker goes to this guy, he goes and finds Harvey, and he talks to him. And Harvey's willing to talk to him, and he's got all kinds of information. Because Harvey was at the University of Maryland at that time, and Harvey had a uh, he had come home from Korea, got a GI Bill, went to college, and the murder happened just around the bend, far from where he was in school. And he decides to take it up as a hobby. I'm going to try and find a killer. And over the years, it becomes an obsession. And just how bad, to find out in a little bit. Well, Riker can't pin anything on him. He's got his files. The man turns his files over to him. And there's information that they can't figure out how he got. But there's no murder weapon. There's no way they can hide, they can pin anything on him. So, uh, in the meantime, Nancy has, I mean, uh, uh, Kathy has been asked by the Washington Post to uh, collaborate with them on whatever's going on from a third party source with the police. And the police decide that they are going to set this guy up. And they're going to have him meet Kathy. And Kathy is going to be wider. She's going to go up to, they're going to meet at Bob's Big Boy on New, New Hampshire Avenue. It's not there anymore. New Hampshire Avenue, right across from the county line in Montgomery County. And so just kind of didn't realize that that's beyond their jurisdiction. Uh, they wanted to film it and put it on as a promo for the county police, which was getting some bad vibes and uh, bad reviews at the time. But Kathy says, no, I'm going to meet him on my end. So she goes out there, and she is worried about this. This guy knows too much. She goes and buys a gun. Buys this gun and she sets down to breakfast with a man who's a bum killer. Uh, he kind of reminded him everybody of Walter Cronkite. Really friendly. You'll like the guy. He's sweet. He's cool. Well, they have breakfast. And he tells her everything. He tells her what he's done and so forth. And it goes in towards lunchtime and then longer. And as they talk, he starts changing. And Kathy asks him, why are you staying with this? He said, because I love your sister. And I always have. But she's dead. 
I talk to her all the time, and she talks to me. Well, this is a little much. Kathy persists because she's always had the feeling that Nancy was somewhere around her. So she uh, uh, she persists, and then he says, you know, I loved her, but you're much like her, and I could love you too. And with that, Kathy gets up and tears at her. Now this is a turning point for her because now she starts to suffer stage three limes. It's going to her brain. She starts having hallucinations. And in these hallucinations, which come in all the time now, sometimes for a day, she'll collapse and be completely yet. These hallucinations, she sees two things. She sees her sister, and she sees, looks like a boy. He's wearing a gabardine torn off coat. His sleeves are torn off. And she has these feelings. And then something happens again. On November 24, 1991, the Washington Post runs the story that they have been gathering from her and from the police and from Harvey. It's called The Murder That Would Not Die. It's on a Sunday edition. It is two full pages with photographs. And it ends with, you don't know who it is. This is uh, difficult for the families. For Kathy, it's very difficult. This is her other cooking. But uh, of course, for River, because her health is really degrading now. And almost every night, she has visions. Sees the same guy in different things. It's like on the river Charon, and he's the river keeper. All these things happen to him, that, I mean, to her that she sees. And she's degrading him. She can hardly walk sometimes. And a fellow moves in to sublet the place because she hasn't got a job now. And this guy, uh, uh, Larry Christensen, becomes her friend. He's an engineer at NASA. And he becomes her friend and her keeper and a watch over her. I won't say it's a love affair, but they do love each other uh, in a paternal way. Her husband, her former husband, even comes back. And you can see how she is degrading rapidly. And she is suffering horribly. But she sees these visions over and over and over again. Pretty much the same person. One day she's out sitting on the balcony and she looks down at the river and she sees a boat coming in. And she starts to see that guy. And she is in terrible pain now. Then, something else happens. On June 15, 2000, 45th anniversary of the murder, a woman um, is taken into custody in um, North Pole, Alaska. And her name is Jean Dobek. Jean Dobek has been captured by the FBI who has been following her and her husband. They're grifters. They have been ripping off people across the United States, insurance companies and so forth. And they are, they've been following her and uh, they finally caught up with her. And she's up there because her son's in the Air Force and she thought she could escape. Her husband had died of cancer in Texas and she was on her own. And when they call, when they captured her, she said, wait a minute, I will tell everything to you, but I want to make a deal. And I have to talk to the police in Prince George's County, Maryland. And what is that deal? He said, I know who killed Nancy Marie Shoman and Mikey Ryan. So they bring the Prince George's police up. And the story she tells is rather interesting because they had just been in Maryland a couple of months before when her husband and they went down to Florida. They went down to Florida to see her husband, Johnny's brother, a guy named Eddie Dobek. 
I saw a highly erased tractor in the hospital, and he was in there, and he was dying of cancer any minute now. And he had called them down. And he brings her over and he says, Listen, I have a deal. If you're ever caught, use this. And he tells them, he tells her the story of how he murdered Nancy and Mikey. They were at the teen club. His father was a Polish immigrant. He was a um, pockmarked faced teenager. Rather rough kid, and his brother. They become very tough kids. And uh, he says that uh, Queen Bee did not want to dance with me. She dissed me. She, she embarrassed me in front of all the kids. And then he um, got really angry and left. And his brother, Johnny, says, we'll have to teach him a lesson. We'll meet him in the park and we'll bring our, our 22s and scare him. The next morning, they walked through the park and um, they stopped them. And Nancy refused to be intimidated. And she uh, launched back and started cursing at him and telling him the, the meaning of them. And Eddie lost it and started shooting. 15, 16, 17 shots. 15 of which hit them. Hit Nancy. Shot Mikey three times simply because she was there. Now, soon afterwards, Kathy, who is really going down, the father dies. Kathy is bereft. She remembers what her sister said, just do it. She's suffering now, suffering badly. She sees her sister one last time. She sees that guy down there. Was it Eddie Dobek? Was he the kid? Was a kid? Was that the guy who did it? Well, now I know. I'm going to end this. I'm just going to do it. She took her pistol. She sat on the feet of an arbor overlooking the course of the river, put the gun to her head and pulled the trigger. May 10th, 2006. With the gun that she had bought, protect herself from the river. Well, all sounds neat. But did Eddie Dobek do this? Deathbed confessions do not hold up in court much less that bad confessions released to somebody else to tell. So did Eddie do it? Well, at the funeral, we discussed this. Um, uh, Kathy, uh, Kathy had left her papers, which I got on show, and she had written a poem. And at the end of the poem, she wrote, in a place of light and love, I now joyfully reside where fear and pain and wrong simply cannot abide. She was buried alongside her sister. But, right next to the gravesite, Harvey preserved a plot. I was going to write this book about Nancy's murder with Kathy. Um, obviously, we didn't do it together, but I had to do it simply to address both of their tragedies. Uh, whether the book sold or not, I didn't care. I just had to make it known. I could, had to change the names of most of the characters. A lot of the characters, well, almost all of them are dead now. I would have done most of my family was dead um, because it's always been an issue. But it's always been an issue to me. Was it Eddie Dobek? Deathbed confessions. Confessions, for whatever reasons. There were a lot of confessions right after the murder. People wanting to get in the papers. Or people wanting to get a three meals in a jail cell. People wanting to just end it all. There was one boy in a reform school who had been beaten as a child. He was badly mangled and everything, and 
tough kid, and he ends up in reform school, and he wanted to get out. So he said, I did it because he wanted to die. Did Eddie go back to it? Who the hell was Eddie go back? After the book came out, I it occurred to me uh, that I could pursue it a little more. I couldn't find it on the internet. I couldn't find it in the phone book. I couldn't find it in any of the normal places. Because uh, he's dead, I didn't find his obituary. Um, but who was he? What was he? No, he was a Polak, a uh, Polish uh, generation. He was, uh, uh, Kathy, uh, Nancy always called him a Polak. The uh, upshot was that, where are we going to find out about him? So I went over to Northwestern High School. I asked the principal there, could I see the yearbook? What do you want it for? And I told him, he said, I don't think so. And finally, I talked to the secretary over there, and she brought it out, and I photographed it. The compass was the yearbook from 1955. And in there was Eddie Dovek's picture. Nice looking guy, right? He had a whole bunch of guns at home, and right after the murder, his father picked up the whole family and left for Florida. That was Eddie Dobek in 1955. This is the Pancho Villa killer. Are they the same? I leave it up to you. Hey, thank you. They, they couldn't do anything because it doesn't hold up the court. And the question about what happened to Gene Dobek, there's two, two ways to go. One, one of the reports is that she got out on a bail in North Pole, Alaska. There's no place you can go in North Pole, Alaska, so they, they let her out. The other one was that um, she uh, went to jail. I could not find a record for it. But when she went out, the one story that she went out on was that she stepped out of the jail and started to walk across the street and was hit by a truck. And that was the end of the story. So, um, which is what I used in the book because I could not find the other one. Um, but a deathbed confession doesn't hold up in court. What's that? The microphone's not what you know of if you're not behind oh, the sorry. laptop. So if you'll repeat the question when it gets asked. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. Uh, you had a question? Yeah, it's been quite a few years since I read the book. But maybe I could do it with, it with another story. But I thought that the detective that reopened the case had found someone that was in prison with the wreck who, who, who confessed. No, that would, I, I think you're confusing that with the Reese case. Um, they were trying to, they were trying to align all those. Jerry Hoover wanted all of those murders to be together. He wanted them as as a serial killer. He was a serial killer. Serial rapists, serial uh, um, uh, every bad thing you can think of. And when he was in jail, uh, he got the death he got the death sentence, but he did not go to the, the um, some lawyers appealed it. He didn't want to appeal. He wanted to die, and they appealed it, and they kept asking him questions. And it was years, some years before they found that the he was involved, he was the guy who killed the medal and uh, the other girl. Um, he did not, uh, he did not uh, exchange with other people as far as I know. I tried, I tried to see him 
and they wouldn't let me see him because he was alive at the time. He died of cancer uh, while I was in jail. He was in federal, federal penitentiary. Um, but I couldn't. So I, I, I'm going from what the record proves. I, so I think that's, that is probably what you're thinking about. Mosier was not in jail. Mosier is the guy who turned by him. Mosier um, received a card, a, a, a little high noon card, from uh, Reese while he was out there in Arkansas, apparently trying to hide from the police because the, the story was getting heavier. And um, that, was, that was what the key for the FBI to go out there and find him was. They went out there and they were able to look at him. Any other questions? There's a question on um, on Zoom that says, "Might Ancestry or 23 and Me DNA help?" So, wonder if there's a. It might. Uh, the I was told that the uh, the um, artifacts, uh, the uh, the elements that were raised, that were found in the park, which included uh, such things. There was a a, a little note. I think there was. Uh, Part of the gabardine shirt, there was some stuff by one of the fire pits. Um, that whether that is still in the collection of the police department, I don't know. But I was told by an officer over there that the, um, the files had been dumped. Ironically, the guy who was in charge of the cold case files, I didn't know it at the time, uh, bought my last house. <laughs> he, his wife was a a clerk of the court, and he was a police officer in charge of the cold case files. I didn't know at the time. But the uh, upside, upside of that was that I received a call from an officer about two years ago who said um, that the files had not been destroyed. So I, I don't know. I haven't made an effort to pursue this any further. It's 67 years old. Any other questions? Thank you very much.